Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Doctors of Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, discuss the art and science of the stuff we're putting on our feet. We've got a really special guest with us here today. We've got Dr. Mike Staropoli. He's a physical therapist. He's also a board-certified orthopedic specialist and a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Um, Mike is the founder of Goal Physiotherapy and Sports Performance in Westport, Connecticut. He's the former PT for the New York Red Bulls soccer team and current PT for individual Red Bull sponsored athletes. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. We're so happy to have you on. Yeah, Andrea, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, I've been a fan of the podcast myself personally, so it's, it's nice to be on the other side and I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk. Oh, yeah. I think our listeners are going to learn a lot from you. So could you tell us first just a little bit about your background um, with PT and sports, um, how you got started with your clinic, and a little bit about how you got started with Red Bull? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I sport as a whole has always been a huge, um, huge part of my life from when I was a kid growing up and and transitioning all the way to now too. you know, growing up, I definitely played a lot of soccer and, and ran as well since number one, it's such a big component of playing soccer, but also enjoyed doing a fair amount of running too. So, um, played soccer through high school and then transitioned to a lot more running and did some triathlon as well. Um, and now do some bike racing, some mountain biking, and I still like to run in my spare time also. Um, a lot of my running this past year was with the New York Red Bulls and doing a lot of return to sport with the athletes as soccer players specifically don't love to do conditioning on their own as, as that mentality from runners is definitely a little bit different from on an individual basis. But, uh, but now I do a lot more mountain biking too, but I certainly understand that mindset of, of the training component and everything that goes into it and, and working towards events or just doing it for a healthy lifestyle too. So, but, um, but yeah, so physical therapist by trade, I've been a physical therapist for too long now, probably a little over 10, 10, 11 years. Um, and yeah, I started out working in a physical therapy clinic that we just saw a lot of people per hour as a higher volume type of place. And it was re really great experience because you get to see a lot of different things and in, in a very dense, shorter period of time. Uh, but I also found out that it, it limited the way I felt like I could help somebody um, just utilizing what my skills were. And, um, and I felt like I could, I could do more for someone than, than what the context of the environment was, you know, I had great mentorship and has helped guide me into you know, what I do today, but, um, I knew I was looking for something different. So 20 in 2016 is when I started goal and, you know, it was, it was just me. It was, I was renting a space from a gym and, and, um, learned a lot in that time period to where we are now. And, um, you know, fast tracking to now goal, we have our facility in Westport. We have an amazing team here that candidly wouldn't be where we are today without them. So, you know, I, to, to thank them for, uh, first is, is definitely always my goal because they're, they're the best, but, you know, um, Jeff Bezos always says to make decisions, you know, knowing 80% of the information is enough because if you wait till you know everything, you've just waited too long and missed opportunity. And I think when I started goal, I probably knew 25% of the information and realized it was in over my head sometimes, but I'm, I'm generally good at taking risk and jumping off the cliff and, and building the plane on the way down and somehow have a safe landing. But, um, but yeah, so when I, at, you know, after about a year or so, when it was just myself, my wife actually joined on with me as a physical therapist too. And, um, that was a big launch pad for us to help create a lot more structure around our business. Um, everything we do is one-on-one -on -one treatment sessions. It's all an hour. That's kind of like, you know, that's, that's the, what we do, but you know, we always say what, we're do, what we are is built for the athlete and the athlete inside of us. You know, we wanted to create a scenario where it was really full support for that person. Um, from a rehab perspective, from a strength and conditioning perspective, we offer both of those as our primary services. But, you know, there's there's so much time, you know, within that hour, which often isn't enough time sometimes, as I'm sure you know, that, like, you want to talk about and really get to know somebody and learn how you can help them. But then you also end up going down these, these rabbit holes of sleep and nutrition and, and the mentality and, and, and all those components that go into an injury to number one, have the best outcome you can, and then really empowering someone to, to 
help manage themselves as well. Cause ultimately as, as much as yes, it's great for business, but you also want someone to have that freedom to do things on their own. So they don't always need someone or need someone for that help and they can do things themselves too. So, um, you know, that was such a big foundation of, of why we started goal and, and, you know, it's grown from, from just myself, you know, renting a 10 by 10 or, you know, a hundred square foot room, I guess, to, uh, to what we have now with our team of about 10 of us. And, and, uh, it's, it's been a wild ride so far and, and I'm looking forward to some things we have coming up in the future too. I've loved following your journey with your business because, um, for listeners who none of you know, Mike and I, uh, live in the same area and I've known Mike for a while through bike racing and PT. And it was just so cool to see Mike's business grow from like one room in a gym to what it is now, because, that was kind of always my goal as a PT to open my own clinic. So to see you doing it and to see just your clinic growing and thriving really inspired me to think that, you know, that's something I could do too. And, you know, now I'm oh, a little under two years in with my own clinic. And yeah, it's it's life changing, isn't it? Just being able to treat patients the way that you know they should be treated and not be limited by insurance limitations or limited by ridiculous productivity expectations you could all you focus on is doing the right thing for the individual patient yeah and i think you know everybody's very aware like i think people look for that and want that too and sometimes it's just a matter of helping guide them and realizing that number one there's so much more support out there for for you know, regardless of that demographic of person, there's so much more out there that you can utilize to help feed your goals of whether whether it is running or you know a 5K or a marathon, or if you just like doing something for a hobby. I think there's a lot to there's a lot you can explore in resources, and it's it's fun to be able to provide at least some sort of niche within that you know within that continuum of of health and performance for someone. So it's yeah, and and the autonomy around doing that and. And helping that person is really nice, you know, like, you know, and even though we have hour sessions, but, um, oftentimes if there's no, nothing in and around those hours, you know, sometimes we find ourselves going an hour and a half or two hours with someone, if they have time, of course, um, just because there's so much passion on both sides of things, if someone's seeking help and us wanting to provide it, that it's, it's, it's refreshing and a whole lot of fun. Yeah. And I loved how you mentioned like all of the, like non, not really non-physical, but things that you don't often hear talked about in a regular PT clinic, nutrition, sleep, stress, all of the things that can influence a person's pain or a person's ability to recover from an injury. But often when you're seeing, you know, three to four patients an hour, you don't have time to address and you're not being reimbursed by insurance companies for doing so. so but addressing those additional things is often key to somebody actually recovering from their issue. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the good thing about those higher volume places is it really helps you prioritize about yes. like, okay, this, this person I have in, in front of me, like what, what do they need and how can I help them most in, in, with, within the constraints and the context we have. But then when you start pulling some of the curtains back there, you realize there's these other places that you can easily help create some guidance or just from a scope of practice perspective, refer someone to the person who's the best fit for them to help them in that way that just can just help move the needle a little bit more or provide that extra motivation or support someone needs to, to help themselves too. Yeah, definitely. Um, so how did you go from owning goal to working with the Red Bulls and the Red Bull company? So, you know, I, my focus has had always been 100% with goal and, and it still continues to at this point. Um, you know, I finished working with the New York Red Bulls, a soccer team it, at the end of January, at the end of their preseason this year, um, mainly because the lifestyle of it is challenging. And I've, I have my wife at home, we have a two and a half year old at home and, and they are certainly my number one. And, and, um, and it, you know, working within in professional sports in a lot of ways is an all in type of commitment. And it's it to find that balance is challenging. And, um, and it was just the time for me that I, I knew I had to make that decision about what's most important for me. But, um, 
how I got involved with that was uh, a couple years ago, I interviewed for another team and just remained in contact with them because they're, uh, they're also local, you know, at Red Bull, we don't really talk about who our rivals are because especially within the tri-state area, but, um, but they were also local. So I'd kept a good working relationship with them because at the youth levels, we see a lot of their athletes. Um, and when Red Bull was looking for a physio, um, they were nice enough to mention me and, and what we do here. And, and, um, it was never really on my radar to, to work in pro sports, but I was just interested in, in, in testing the water. So, um, when I spoke to them, the conversations just kind of kept continuing and continuing. And when they offered me a position, it was, you know, being soccer is one of my, my backgrounds in, in sport. And that's my home club too. I just, I felt like my wife and I decided together that it was worth the risk to test out. And knowing that I fortunately have goal back home that if, if it wasn't something that I wanted to do, I, I, I have there as, as, um, something to come back to as well. So that, that made it easy to number one, take the risk and then, and know that I do have something else that I, that I can do as well. But, and then working with Red Bull sponsored athletes, it was, it was really fortunate, you know, Red Bull wanted to keep me in their Red Bull family. So, um, we're currently in that transition process now of, of what I'll be starting to do is really working with them, with them, with some of their, both their competitions or training camps or, or events. So, you know, they have a facil- a training facility, what they call athletic athlete performance center, APC out in Austria. And then one in Santa Monica, California as well. So when either an athlete get in, gets injured or they go there for periodic testing and assessment, um, you know, I may be going there to help out sometimes, but a lot of times it's also just going to more of their competition and events. And then, you know, if anyone's in this area, they're obviously always welcome to goal too. So, um, which we've been we're lucky enough to have one or two do that so far. Cause I think logistically it helps a lot. So the nice thing about it is I'm home so much more and with my family and with my amazing team at goal, but I still get to be involved in, in what's an awesome company and with, with athletes of complete, diversity in sport that I've really never worked with before as well. So, um, that in itself is, is really fascinating. Yeah. You must really be expanding your horizons because Red Bull sponsors athletes in pretty much every okay. sport imaginable, including some pretty wild sports. Huh? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, when you, you buy a car and then all of a sudden you see it all over the place on the road. That's what I noticed when I joined the Red Bull team too. Um, all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're big on their brand being on your head. So it's a hat or a helmet. Um, all of a sudden I see them everywhere in the tour de France, in skateboarding in snowboarding in mountain biking in something that in skydiving, something I never even realized, you know, they're, they really do have a very big global brand and, and, um, it's fascinating to learn about a lot of those different sports too. You know, I've, I've worked with you know, one of the athletes I've, I've worked with recently, I've, number one, never worked with someone in that sport before. And then number two, never really had to think about what the demands of that sport were from a rehab and training perspective. So um, it's been challenging and, and a whole lot of fun. Yeah, it's fun to take like your current skill set and expand and learn something new and then apply it to an athlete who maybe you haven't considered what their needs are and then, you know, hopefully seeing them succeed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, awesome. So we're going to get into the main segment of our podcast in just a minute. But first, we want to do our subjective question for our listeners. So um, since we're talking to Mike, and he works with so many pro athletes, uh, I want our listeners to imagine if you had unlimited time for running, if you were a pro, what would you change about your training routine? I don't know, Mike, what would you change? Yeah. I mean, for, for me, it's pretty easy. I, you know, like I said earlier, I have a two and a half year old at home. So if I had unlimited time, I would 100% prioritize sleep more, but, um, that's not always up to me. And I don't always have that control over my sleep schedule. Cause sometimes our daughter just decides we're going to wake up at five 15 and that's how the day is going to go. Yep. Party <laughs> before the sun comes up, right? Yeah, there is no <laughs> doubt about it. <laughs> Yeah, I I would agree with that. Sleep, I mean, you and I both know sleep is so important for athletes in terms of recovery and just adapting to training. So, yeah, having a little more time for sleep, uh, maybe having a little more time for all of the, like, non-training things. So, like, the recovery stuff that helps you absorb the training you're doing. Um, But, 
I think uh, we can all agree that getting a little more sleep is a benefit for most athletes. So next, uh, Mike, I want to talk to you a little more about your clinic here in Westport Goal. Um, so we already talked a little bit about like how you founded that practice and what led you to do that. So let's talk a little bit for our listeners. How can our listeners identify what a high quality PT clinic is? You know, there's PT clinics everywhere. If you live in like even a small metropolitan area, you've probably got three or four clinics to choose from. So how can they know that they're going to a high quality clinic? What are some of those attributes? I think finding one sometimes can be challenging because, you know, it is so dense, right? Even just if you drive down post road where we are, there's probably eight different options. So it can be overwhelming. <clears throat> you know, I think especially in endurance sports, there's such a big community around, regardless of what the sport is, whether it's running, triathlon, cycling, etc. I probably lean on my community there to help find the appropriate resource for me first and foremost, because those recommendations are really valuable. But I think from qualities you're looking for in a clinic or in a person, I think they're very foundational on like more of a human level. So like finding a, a physio who can listen, can truly, truly listen and care. You know, I think a lot of times when you have a conversation with someone, that other person is thinking so much about what they want to say next to add to the conversation and don't always really p- truly digest what you're saying. So, you know, when in, in our evaluations, like a lot of times I'll just ask a question and then just sit back and just let someone talk because to jump in in the middle of that and cut them off and go down a specific way of, you know, if they t- mention something about training and then all of a sudden you're like, well, what kind of shoes or how many miles a week or whatever that is like, you know, if, when you let them just talk and they start to open up more and give you more information than you think, you or then you would have gotten otherwise you know because i think when you start to interject too much you find out two sessions later they're like oh yeah i broke my ankle too it's like what do you why didn't that come up in past medical history and i think sometimes it's because they can't really get into a flow of communicating that well so i think that's one of the biggest and most important skill sets you know a a, a good physio can have at at a good facility i think you know with the community around endurance sports i think community around the place you go to for rehab and training is is really important that they share the same values and health and lifestyle and performance too i i don't necessarily think someone if you're a runner you need to go to a, always have to go to a run specific facility because i think you know at least here we try to take like an athlete first perspective so we think they're really kind of core things as an athlete or as a person you really should be able to do from a health and, and performance perspective and then that last 10% is really what differentiates the cyclist from a footballer to the, to the mountain biker or something like that. So um, that good community and culture about where you rehab and train is, is awesome. And then somewhere that empowers the client to learn and to take ownership too. You know, I think sometimes when we have an injury, you, you may see so something say, see this as well. Of like someone falls on you to, for you to give them the answer. And as much as we might help, guide them and figure that out it really comes down to them really feeling like they can take ownership over it and they don't need to always just rely on somebody so i think if someone's truly listening to you and it's a place you feel motivated to be and that can support you and you leave there feeling empowered that you can do it yourself i think that's that's the most important thing and i think more so than being being a physical therapist i think that's probably one of my better skills more so than helping someone with actual rehab but just helping someone kind of open the doors and realize they can help manage it themselves too is 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 probably one of my better skills but those would probably be the top three things i would look for in in a place and and somewhere that's that from a physical perspective is just built out to support some you know someone like you as well you know even here like we have a strip of turf so people can run sprint change of direction and stuff like that whereas in some types type of facilities they may not really be built out to help support someone in that nature also. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, You know, getting back to what you said about listening, it brought to mind a couple of things. One, the famous quote, I think from Dr. William Osler, who said, listen to your patient, he will tell you the diagnosis. And it's so true. If you just let somebody talk, they will give you so much more information than if you keep interrupting them with specific questions. And the other thing is, I remember that there is some research study that found that, and I think it was done on primary care doctors, but that on average, 
patients are allowed to talk for like two minutes before their doctor interrupts them. Right. And <laughs> that it's a good thing for all healthcare practitioners to remember is that keep your mouth shut, let your patient talk. You will learn so much more from listening than from interrupting and asking, like forcing the conversation to go in the direction you think it should go. Yeah. Because you might miss like that, them telling you about their ankle fracture that absolutely could be involved in the knee or the hip pain that they're there to see you for. I mean, how many times have you seen a patient who comes in and they're like, yeah, I went to my doctor and they saw me for two minutes and I didn't even ask six of the questions I planned on asking. And, and in a lot of times that's, that ends up being the reason why it's because they don't feel like they have control of, of that situation. And I think right. just stepping back and listening just allows that, that client to help really take control for themselves too. Yeah. And, you know, I think you and I both started out when you started as a PT, were you on electronic medical record or paper Ooh. documentation? It's bad that I can't remember. Um, <laughs> I think, I think we were already on EMRs, but it, but it was recent. It was probably okay. within 18 months prior to that. Cause I had worked at that company prior to being a physical therapist that I think we made that transition. I think. Well, I'm going to date myself then. Cause when I graduated, definitely still on paper records and mm -hmm. having a laptop between you and your patient really interferes with communication. So I really tend to either put the laptop aside and just listen and then say, okay, give me a minute so I can write this down. Or I just keep it aside and I document like periodically throughout the visit because having that impersonal object of a laptop between you and your patient, especially somebody that you're meeting for the first time, can really just interfere with first developing a rapport with that person, but also them feeling comfortable enough to open up to you and give you the information that you need to help them. Yeah, no, for sure. I think um, you know, we we have an internship program here too for strength conditioning and for, for physical therapy, for clinical rotations. And one one thing I always do when I'm talk when I talk to them, I was like, I take out my phone and hold it in my hand, right? And I'll have a conversation with them, and then afterwards I'll be like, Hey, how did you feel about me holding my cell phone in my hand? They're like, Well, it kind of distracted me, and I didn't really hear all you're saying. I was like, Exactly, right? So it's like when we're here, we're here for the person that's in front of us, and we shouldn't have those things as a distraction, waiting for a text or a message, even if it's from a doctor. Like we can check that at an appropriate time, right? And it's so not having those things there is is valuable in terms of the full, you know, client experience too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you about just how does your clinic assess runners? What, so we all know that running requires high levels of strength, force development, range of motion, flexibility, cardiovascular fitness. So if you have an injured runner coming in to see you, besides all of the usual tests that you learned in PT school, what higher level performance tests might you use with your runner patients? Yeah, so it, I really think that depends, and, and I hate giving that answer, but... Oh, no, we um, love that I'll, answer. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll provide a little bit more context. You know, I think there's so, there's so many different tools you can test people with today. Right. <clears throat> and I think... You know, especially like my inbox is gets flooded with the different technologies that are out and everybody wants to add a subscription for you. But um, I think it really depends on just like almost in peer reviewed literature, what question do you want to answer? Right. <clears throat> so that really helps guide us in, in creating basically an athlete or a client profile. So within that, we're, we're looking at a lot of foundational things of what I would say like a movement archetype, but like, just think about like just good quality movement. So if you, we could talk about native range of motion or baseline range of motion, but just looking at something like a lunge or a squat, I think for runners specifically, you look at like a single leg calf raise to fatigue and you can look at a symmetry of those and in, in, in looking at what the strength component is, it is there. Um, with runners, you're assessing ankle dorsiflexion, which is your you know range of motion there too. But that's also a potential risk factor for injury, like Achilles injuries. Um, two other things we'll do as well. I think depending on the person and their their training age, their time in a gym, um, the injuries they've had as well is doing any. We have a, what's called a dual force plate system. So it's basically two force sensors on the ground where. You can jump whether you want to do a double leg jump or a single leg jump. There's different testing 
there's different testing profiles, but there's also a ton of data we get from that, from your power production to looking at your left and right symmetry, um, how quickly you generate force. You mentioned rate of force development as well. And I, and I think that all goes back to what questions we want to answer. You know, if someone's having an Achilles injury, for example, you know, maybe we can see that, oh yeah, well, there is a 26% asymmetry in this phase of your jumping and maybe more of single leg jumping if we're talking about a runner since it's effectively what running is in, on some progressive way. Um, and it might just help give us some information to use when we're creating a treatment or a training plan for somebody. And I think that's a really important thing is it's only one piece of information and it's out of context of a sport too. So it's putting you on some steel plates, having you jump and you're looking at a computer and looking at all these numbers. So, um, it does help provide some information and also help show somebody progress as you reassess. So let's say, you know, for other injuries, we'll test weekly, but for, let's say if it's a chronic type injury, like an overuse injury, patellar tendinopathy or Achilles, Achilles tendon injury, we'll probably test a little bit less frequently because we may not see as quick of a change. Um, but then when you go back to it and you look at it historically over, let's say a three month period, you can be like, Oh, that asymmetry is cleaning up or, Oh, my, my force development has increased or I'm creating force quicker. And those are things I think, number one, that show the client that, Hey, I, I am trending better and I am getting better with all this effort I'm putting in. Um, and I think kind of bigger picture, it helps just give us more information if we want to track longer term for that person too. Um, as well. <clears throat> Definitely. And that type of you know, using the dual force plates to get rate of force development and all of those measures can also be useful over time. Let's say that person came in for like a checkup every six to 12 months. If you see their single leg hopping rate of force development trending in the wrong direction, you might be able to catch a injury before it happens. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think, I think, kind of like I mentioned earlier, it, it, it depends on how frequently. I think when when you measure frequently, it gives you more information because there's also stuff that can kind of tell you about fatigue or any changes with that. So, like when you measure, let's say it's once every six months or once a year, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if someone ran twenty miles a day before where sure. everything yeah. is going to be subdued. So, if I'm comparing it to something six months earlier, it probably isn't going to show necessarily progress. Mm -hmm. So when you have a bigger bolus of information, it helps provide a little bit more context to it. But I think, you know, a PT checkup, so to say, periodically is, is really valuable. But I, I, I think kind of bigger picture of that, it's also important to really formulate your go-to people who are in your corner for, you know, number one, your, your overall health, but, but, especially feeding your athletic performance to whether it's a physio, your strength and conditioning coach, nutritionist, your mindset coach, things like that. You know, there are things that are readily available on at the professional level, but I think in today's world, it's much more accessible now for all of us more amateur athletes too. So, um, but yeah, no, I think that's having some sort of PT checkup or, <clears throat> or, um, you know, kind of like you'd have your annual physical with your general practitioners is definitely a valuable, a valuable tool and use of time. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I do that a lot for the runners and cyclists that I work with. And it, it just helps people stay on track. You can update like what the appropriate strength exercises they should be doing are. You can, it's a good chance to review their training, make sure there aren't any things that are kind of like flashing warning signs. Um, and people appreciate having, you know, that relationship where your PT really gets what you're doing. They understand your training background. They're not like starting over with a new person every time they come in. They, you're their person who understands the physical aspect of their training. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it provides a platform that can easily ask questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in, especially within running, a lot of times injuries can be, when I say more chronic, they like creep up a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in soccer, we oftentimes, well, if we have a hamstring injury, like you can, you know exactly when it happened. Oftentimes, especially at Red Bull, like we'll have it on film and training or in a match so you can watch it happen and when you look back at it. Um, and there's a specific mechanism there, whereas if it's a 
if it's a running related injury, sometimes those are chronic load related type injuries where, you know, that six month or year checkup might be enough to just have that conversation of they're like, yeah, you know, my Achilles, every time I run starts to feel a little sore, but you know, 12 minutes in, it starts to go away and doesn't really hurt again until a half an hour afterwards. It's like, well, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. And maybe we can create some sort of plan or, or solution based plan to make sure it doesn't become anything more than that as well. And, and then you end up losing time training and racing or depending on what your goal is. Yeah. And, you know, I'm glad that you brought up the dual force plate in that testing because <clears throat> not limited to runners, but thinking about like athletes coming back from ACL reconstruction, we know that to really know when somebody is ready to return to sport, it one, it takes a lot longer than we used to think it does with regards to like ACL reconstruction. And two, you really have to do high level functional tests like single leg hop for distance, um, some of the other single leg hopping type tests to really see if there is still a significant asymmetry. So, and I've seen so many patients, particularly patients after ACL reconstruction, where their insurance has cut them off from further visits because, you know, they can walk and they can go up and down stairs. And a lot of insurance companies don't care if you can get back to playing basketball or playing soccer. So for athletes who can do all the normal life things but still not do their sport, how can they know that they're really ready to resume training? Yeah, I think I think there are different levels to that. I think, you know, first of all, it depends how we define what training is. Um, cause in, in my mind, you can always train. It's just a matter of what it is or maybe the modality or there's always something we can do there. So, um, and a lot of times I'll use what the, basically what I call the bank analogy for that. So when someone has an injury, if we think about three buckets, we have our, our medical bucket, which will lump kind of physio into our training bucket, which is going to be more like strength and conditioning based. And then our sport bucket, which would be running, you know, when an injury happens, let's, you know, Maybe nine of the ten dollars we have to spend each day, currently, you know, in the acute phase, is all in that medical bucket, and you have a dollar to spend in that training phase. Where maybe that means that you're doing some upper body stuff when, because your ankle is injured, or you're doing some swimming or something like that. So, and then as you kind of progress on that continuum, you kind of shift a couple of those dollars you're going to spend. Maybe it's a little more into training. So you still have some some medical, some rehab. You're doing a little bit more training too. And maybe now you don't have to be non weight bearing in a pool. Maybe that can shift more to some bike related work. And then you continue to shift more and more of those dollars slowly into your sport too. So I think there's a difference between being out and I, and not being able to train and being able to do something, which going back to one of your earlier questions too, I think it, that's where it really matters what type of provider you find too, because the answer of well, if this hurts, let's just completely rest and shut it down. Just, it, I don't, I think in today's world isn't good enough. And right. I do think there's, as, as someone who I think is, for me, I'm always a solution first person when there's a problem. I, I tend not to ruminate on that. It's like, okay, well, how do we fix this and move forward? And then we can figure out how not to have that problem again once we, once we solve this. But I think you really have to kind of assess it that way of how much can you still do, to, whether it's to maintain fitness or just your sanity, um, but also help move you back towards your sport. <clears throat> but in terms of, you know, how do we know when someone's ready? I think the first question is like, are you still in pain? Right. And then, and then from there we look at kind of, have we stored, restored some of our native range of motion? Can the joint and the tissue start to handle some load again, primarily in the gym we would start with just because that's generally going to be less force created than anything with running or sprinting to that nature. Um, and from there, it's really a gradual progression. So, you know, if I, if I look at running and, and regress it and kind of make it break it down into individual skills, I'd go back to some, like you mentioned earlier as well, like some hopping and skipping related drills. So if they can handle low volume of a skip or a single leg hop, well, then maybe we can progress that a little bit to doing some lower volume, low intensity running on a softer surface. And maybe that's a field first or a track first before you progress back to on the road running. So I think you just kind of have to take your sport and regress it to what you can tolerate. And then it's a slow build back up into that too. So, but you know, pain 
pain typically isn't normal. It's usually a, a warning sign of your body telling you, hey, something may not be quite right. So that should be a good indicator of, let me go back to my team and have them check it out. And then we can fi figure out how much of my sport I can continue to do. And then where can I modify the stress and the load to allow myself to recover as well? Yeah. And, and I think runners definitely tend to not do that. And they say, oh, I'm having some pain, but I can still run through it. So I'm okay. But yeah, I, I, of course, I, the sooner you get it looked at, the less likely it is to turn into a yeah. problem that takes you out for several months. Yeah, I think it was I think it was Chris Johnson, who's a, who's a runner physio as well. He had mentioned, I think this is the quote, he said, 80% of runners run at 80% of the intensity 80% of the time. And I'm 100% <laughs> yes. guilty of that. But, you know, you can't always hit full gas all the time because certain tissues need longer time to recover than others. And sometimes when we don't allow that, that's where some of those injuries creep up on us. Yeah. That, uh, that's a good quote from Chris Johnson. That's funny. <laughs> so last question uh, regarding like just your general work with goal. Um, mm -hmm. I know you've worked with some elite and pro runners in the past. So when a pro runner is injured, obviously their rehab is going to look a little different than someone with a full-time job. So how might, let's say a pro runner has Achilles tendonitis, what might their rehab process look like? And maybe also including more than just physio, like what are they doing with other providers to help them get back to their normal training? Yeah. One of the biggest things from, from an elite runner and, and professional support perspective is the immediate access you typically have to something. So if you or I or, or anyone else in our community typically would get hurt, it's like, well, you know, this is feeling a little bit hot and sore, but I'm going to keep training and just see how it responds. And we don't really tell anybody. Whereas, you know, if, if one of the elite runners gets injured, you know, their athletic trainer, or their physio is at the track with them. Usually if it's a team training, sometimes if they're training remotely, it's different. Um, and, but their head coach is there. Their physio athletic trainer is there as well. So you immediately communicate, hey, this wasn't really feeling right. You know, your coach using his skill set can either modify training or just watch you during training, see if anything's changing or that's impacting the way you move. And then you have immediate triage there too to assess it and potentially refer you to a team doctor or something like that. So part of part of I think what helps so much when is just that that access you have to different things at a, at a quicker rate. Um, but I, I think when we look at all of us as amateurs too, I think that can come back to us and be like, well, I can probably communicate better to people as well when I am feeling something. Cause it doesn't mm -hmm. always mean I have to shut it down, but <clears throat> yeah, they have that access. They have their people there with them as well. Um, and they have access to any sort of additional tests if they need to, too. And, and, you know, yearly physicals with, all their team doctors and specialists and, and as well that just can help provide them more information. Um, so, and yes, they have a little bit more time in the day, but believe it or not, similar to the same challenges we have, whether it's sleep or nutrition or anything, they fall victim to those same things too. So, you know, I, with, with my runners, I haven't had those type of conversations as much, but my soccer players, I 100% have. So, um, so they have a lot of the same challenges. They just have a little bit more time in the day to deal with it. And a lot of it is, you know, you look at some of the things where that, that are half percent. So maybe a little bit more often I get some soft tissue from my physical therapist because I can help desensitize the area prior to training and running that can just make it a little bit more successful. So sometimes it's those little things that just kind of help get you through the day. And then it allows you other time frames where <clears throat> you're going to dive deeper into it and work on it maybe after some key a races or, or anything like that too. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, they have a little bit more support than we have at a more immediate level. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, you know, in thinking how amateurs can learn from the pros, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like they have immediate access. And one thing that amazingly, a lot of people still don't know is in most States, I think it might actually be all States. Now people have direct access to physical therapy so by law, you do not need to see a doctor and get a prescription to go see a physical therapist. Now, your insurance company might require you to get a script for them to pay for it, but you can always see a PT outside of your insurance with Medicare being the exception, but we won't get into that here, um, w without waiting to see a doctor. So I think 
people who are amateur runners who are starting to feel like a little twinge in their knee or their Achilles or their back, just go see your PT that you know and have them check you out. And it is better to get it looked at earlier than later. And you might nip it in the bud and it won't become a problem. Yeah. And I think, and I think if it, if it is something that is a challenge, you're at least having those conversations immediately to move it in the right direction. Um, but yeah, as you said, with direct access, I, I always tell people, it's like you can literally walk right into our facility off the streets <clears throat> yep. and schedule an appointment. And if your insurance company does need more authorization or a script, usually it's after the initial evaluation. Right. So they can certainly yeah. do that. Yeah. <clears throat> so next I want to kind of transition to talking about your work with the Red Bulls team and then with the Red Bulls um, individual athletes. Mm-hmm. So we talked a little bit about how working with them is different from your work at goal, but I would love to just know more what it was like working with the team. Like, were you on the road every day of the week? Um, were you at all of their practices, all of their games? How did it work out for you? Yeah. You know, we, at Red Bull, we, you know, physical therapists in soccer in the United States, ironically, isn't really common. It's becoming more common, but it's very athletic training driven Mm -hmm. in that sense, which, and we had some amazing athletic trainers at Red Bull and it was really awesome to be part of that team. But so we actually had two physical therapists on staff. So we alternated a lot of the games we traveled for. So if there's 34 games in a year, um, half of those being home, I probably ended up traveling, you know, six to eight of them um, last year, if I reflect back to it. But yeah, you're at every every home game for sure, every single training session too. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the nice thing about it is it's it's full service and full support, right? So there's you have your physical therapists and your athletic trainers on the performance side, your strength and conditioning coaches and, and your, your head of performance which really manage kind of the load of training. Um, you know, that would, that would be analogous to, you know, that the weekly periodization of a running plan is what the, kind of the head of performance does too. Um, and right down the hall, you have your coaching staff and right down the hall, my favorite place is you had at the cafeteria, which was always awesome. So break two meals a day prepared for you. was pretty sweet, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, and then <laughs> Can't discount that. No, it's, it's, it's a, it's also a financial perk. You don't always account for on a weekly basis too. So it's, it, it has its pros for sure. Um, the, the only downside is it's always immediately available. Um, but, uh, but yeah, at the facilities too, you know, right outside our door, we have two really perfect pitches that, that the grounds crew always have to, uh, you know, a certain softness and density as well, because that's, that has shown to help from an injury perspective too. Um, and then our gym and our recovery section too. So it's, it's going back to kind of, you know, immediate access that our elite runners have had. I mean, it, it's no different in, in professional soccer too. And, 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 you know, I think with running sometimes it, an elite team might have different athletes doing different events in different places where the soccer team always travels as one unit. So it's, it's a lot less remote management and a lot more in-person management too. So with your individual athletes who are traveling quite a bit, are you doing a lot of like telehealth visits or are you communicating maybe with local physios who are where that athlete is competing? How does that work out in terms of continuity of care? Uh, It's a little, it, it depends on the situation. A lot of times I'll manage, help manage them remotely. You know, we had one athlete who was at a training camp in Arizona who actually one of Red Bull's other physios went to, to that camp with them, but they were local to New York. So I was seeing them a fair amount here. So it was my communication with her about where that current athlete, that current athlete's status was what he was able to do for his sport, what we were doing in terms of the rehab perspective as well. Um, but then, you know, after that he was home for a week and then he was down in South America somewhere. So, um, that's where it becomes a little bit more remote management also of just, just check-ins too. Cause a lot of times they are very independent. Um, and, but check-ins how things are going or if they have any questions on things, but usually I'll kind of give them a, depending on where they are in their rehab as well, if they need more daily and weekly check-ins or if there's something where you can kind of give them a month block of training and just 
make sure they're doing the work type of thing too. So um, it's a combination of both in terms of remote management and communication with local physios. Yeah. So uh, talking about that, how do you monitor your athletes training status? I mean, I'm sure part of that is more like the performance team and the coaches, but is there, what, what are you looking for in saying, Oh, we better like take a look at this guy. He's showing some signs of like additional fatigue. We don't want to let that go down the wrong road. I think it, it, like you said, our performance team definitely is more of the manager of all of a lot of that, but it, I think ultimately, you know, just like a, a running training plan. If you're working with a coach, you'll, you'll have your weekly plan. You know, you know what your typical intensities are for different types of training and, within soccer there's a couple things we usually do weekly testing for jumping and hamstring strength and um they have gps monitors on them as well so we see every single move they're doing on the field and at what speeds and how much they're changing direction and how much distance they cover and stuff so you look at what was our plan and our target for that session and then where where did they fall within that? Are they you know within a normal one standard deviation, or or there some big outlier for some reason? Um, and then we have some of the other data that we would test in the gym from their jumping and strength scores too. And again, we track that weekly, so like we can see what normal we know what normal recovery is after a game from like a hamstring strength perspective. Typically, mm-hmm. that'll take forty eight hours, and if we're still not seeing tissue recovery there. Then we wait another day. And if it's still not there, then we know something's probably up. Mm -hmm. So, and it'll foster, you know, lead to further investigation. So, um, there's basically some data points we look at and we just have a fair amount of that information that we can compare back to, to see if there's changes there. Um, but so the on-field stuff is more the performance staff and then some of the more clinical stuff is usually what we manage. That's really interesting about the like hamstring strength testing and jump testing. Are there, I mean, there must be a ton of research studies out there with like normative data about what, what should your hamstring strength be 24 hours after a game, 48 hours after a game as compared to baseline. So are you using numbers from research or more like internally developed numbers? How do you, how do you know what the numbers mean? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, we always use evidence in in peer-reviewed literature as one way to support our decision-making, but, you know, it's depending on who the player is. You know, if we're talking about a hamstring injury, have they ever had a hamstring injury before? If they have, and we noticed, well, two days after, they're still not recovering, but the last four games they did, well, what's going on now? Because Mm -hmm. they've had four hamstring injuries and we don't want it to lead to a fifth. So what strategies can we take to reduce that risk and allow more recovery? Um, If they haven't had a hamstring injury, they're not mentioning any soreness or delayed onset muscle soreness or any pain and nothing's changing with how they move. And we'll probably be a little bit more comfortable with them being more participatory in training after, after a day off and after a regen session. So it, it, depends on the person in the scenario, their mm-hmm. past history and, you know, their age too, right. You know, the two biggest predictors of, of injury are previous injury and being an older athlete, yeah. you know? So, so if they're, if they're younger and haven't had an injury, that's going to make us feel a lot more comfortable than if they've had a bunch of hamstring injuries and they're one of the senior guys at the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So yeah, you mentioned that the athletes wear those GPS devices, which for people who have watched soccer, it's they they almost look like I think they kind of look like sports bras, but they look like cutoff vests. And soccer players run a lot in games. Like, what's an average distance for, like, um, an offensive player in a game? Usually you'll see players on the team running anywhere between 10 and 12 kilometers in a match. That is a lot of running. So, but that being said, it's, it's very different than... You know, if you were a runner and running tw- 10 mm-hmm. to 12 K, that may be a little bit more of a steady state type of effort, or, right. or at least if it's a race, you're basically kind of pinning it to your threshold for that time, potentially, mm-hmm. you know, there's, you know, of that 10 to 12 K only, <clears throat> let's say three to 400 meters of it is, is sprinting. And, 
you know, you might have five, 500 to a thousand meters of it is what we'd call high speed running, which is basically like a high, hard tempo. Um, the rest of it is jogging and, and walking and, and stuff like that too. So there's more that goes into that distance number. And I know, mm-hmm. you know, if you watch the world cup or something, they always highlight those numbers, but there's a whole lot more that goes into it than just what that number is. And, you know, it, it's less about the, the total distance and more about some of those higher intensity moments or, you know, the, the accelerations and decelerations that happen on the field too, that are going to be more of the high risk moments that we would track of Mm -hmm. in terms of the volume of them. Um, but yeah, they give you a plenty of information about what a player is doing on the field, which is Mm -hmm. pretty cool. Yeah, that is awesome. So like you mentioned, and you know, most people realize runners and soccer players both do a lot of running, but their training and the type of running they do is very different. But is there anything you think that our runner listeners can learn from the way that soccer players train for their running? Yeah, you know, I think at, you know, if we're talking about like a professional soccer club, um, the variability in training, you know, with soccer, we, there's a lot of variables you can change from, from a training session, whether it's the size of the field. So the bigger the field, the more distance it is. And the less change of directions, but you might get more access to high speed or top speed. Mm -hmm. Shorter fields is a lot more acceleration, deceleration, but not a lot of total distance, but it's a whole lot more high intensity. Um, And we know there's normal recovery times of a lot of those different energy systems. So whereas going back to the comment I mentioned earlier about Chris Johnson running 80% intensity, 80% of the time, I think a lot more variability in your training is so valuable, you know, whether it's a tendon injury or, or bone stress injuries, those things, you know, after a higher, harder training session, take a certain amount of time to recover. So if you mix in a little bit of low intensity periodization into that, it allows enough recovery to keep you moving forward instead of having to press pause or taking some steps back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And conversely, like if you're training for a marathon and doing a lot of like, you know, tempo slash zone three slash marathon pace training, still throw in some strides at like mile or two mile pace a couple days a week, just to keep training both those energy systems, but also introducing different load to your musculoskeletal system. Yeah. You know, it's, I had one of the, one of the runners I work with, he runs middle distance. He's a one mile runner and, but he still runs between 70 and 90 miles a week, you know, and obviously that's a very different level than, than many, but you know, it's still a really large aerobic base and plenty of higher threshold work, but a lot of lower threshold work too. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that variability is really important just to create a more well, well well-rounded and first and foremost, healthy runner. Definitely. So, you know, Doctors of Running is primarily a uh, shoe site, so I can't let you go without talking about shoes. So (laughs) running shoes with Piba, which is like the super foam that's in the Nike Vaporfly and Alpha Fly, have really revolutionized the running world. Like world records are dropping right and left Mm. in every distance. And some soccer cleats have Piba midsoles now. Um, Nike has one, Mizuno has one, Umbro has one. So... Have you and like are your athletes wearing those shoes? I'm sure it depends on sponsorship. But in the soccer world, do people care about Piba the way that runners care? Not quite. It, I don't think it's made as big of an impact there yet. <clears throat> I mean, it's clearly revolutionized running in the way you just mentioned. You know, with with soccer, we look at a couple different things in terms of you know, the upper and what's made of the cleat. Cause you also need that tactile stimulus of feeling the ball at your foot. <clears throat> and then there's different, there's some shoes that have like a, the carbon insert that just make it a little bit stiffer shoe. Um, some players like that. Some don't, some have end up having some foot issues because it's a little more rigid and they need mm-hmm. to be a little more forgiving. Um, we haven't seen as much of that midsole Piva in, involved yet, <clears throat> but depending on the, the, you know, at the amateur level, especially for someone coming back from an injury, you can play around with the cleat selection in terms of, you know, the, the rotary traction to it. <clears throat> so a longer stud and those blades that are in cleats versus just a normal circular stud uh, are going to have a lot more rotary traction to it, which sometimes if you're coming back from an ACL injury, may be a little bit too aggressive to start. So especially if it's, you know, a 16 year old girl coming back from that, 
we'd probably have them do use a little bit more of a turf shoe or just a rounded shorter stud because it's going to be a little bit more forgiving. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of the technology in shoes, a lot of people prioritize it being really, really tight, it being a little bit stiff and having really good traction. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are probably some of the bigger priorities, but within that too, and sponsors probably wouldn't appreciate it, but I've definitely seen my fair share of players manually change some of the build of their cleats with scalpels and <laughs> filing studs and all that type of stuff too. So it's, oh, that's <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Klein would love to hear about that. He's been known to uh, perform surgery on his running shoes as well. Oh yeah. Happy to yeah, share I'm... those stories anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one final question for you. So, you know, you work with so many professional athletes, I have one final question for you. You work with so many professional athletes. What can our listeners who are mostly everyday amateur athletes learn from them? Just a couple things that everybody, regardless of how much time you have or how much you train, could do to be a better, more well-rounded athlete. Yeah, I think one of the first things is consistency. You know, and I think that can be both in your training and, and in your recovery. <clears throat> and you can definitely take, regardless of volume, even if you're doing some low volume training and it's two to three days a week, you, you can be ruthlessly consistent with that and do really, really well with your recovery with that too. You know, I think it was Dustin Navin with the U S Olympic committee said his most successful athletes completed set eight, over 80% of their training. Right. So, and yes, that's at the Olympic level, but you can be successful at a local 5k or, or your marathon. If you're consistent with your training, and you're recovering. And I think that requires good communication with your coach. If you're working with one, with your physio and your support team behind you, um, as well. And then really dialing in sleeping well, eating a, a, a healthy diet based on, you know, any restrictions you may or may not have to, I think the, the biggest thing is just consistency and, and, and really being very, very good at that. And if, if you are at that, that'll help manage a lot of a lot of the unplanned things that come up because there always are in training, but it'll help at least keep you moving forward and in the right direction when those things occur. Right. Yeah. It's almost better to be a little bit underperforming than pushing the limit and having to take a few days off because you flared something up. For sure. Yeah. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. I think our listeners are going to come away from this episode learning a lot. And it's just so interesting hearing about your work with the Red Bulls and with the individual Red Bull athletes. Um, And we'll put in the show notes where to find Mike on social media. Um, As always, you can find us, Doctors of Running, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, podcast is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So send us an email. Um, it's doctors of running at gmail.com. We love to hear your questions. We try to have Q&A episodes every so often. So please, if you've got a question or a comment for us, find us online and let us know. Thanks so much, Mike. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and hope to see you soon. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Really grateful to be on the podcast with you and looking forward to continuing to be a fan and a listener too. Yeah, thank you again. (laughs)